let's think about the mathematical model that we need to solve for this convection problem. It turns out to be a boundary value problem similar to the conduction problem that some of you might have gone through. Except that the boundary value problem that you get for convection is much more complicated than the boundary value for a boundary value problem for conduction. Let's take a look at the boundary value problem. And the boundary value problem consists of governing equations defined in a domain and boundary conditions defined at the edges of the domain. Let's take a look at the governing equations first. They are based on the conservation laws. So here's conservation of mass applied to a vanishingly small chunk of fluid, and we'll get del dot v equal to zero if we assume that density is constant, which is what we will do. And then you have conservation of momentum applied to a vanishingly small chunk of fluid. Um, this is F equal to ma. The forces are on the right-hand side here. That's the net pressure force on our uh, vanishingly small chunk of fluid and that's the net viscous force, and this is all written per unit volume, and this term here is the acceleration. And then you have conservation of energy um, and, and applied to our, our vanishingly small chunk of fluid, and that's the rate of change of enthalpy um, of the packet of fluid, that's the heat conducted in, and that's the viscous dissipation. If you look at the big ideas in fluid dynamics, I try to give you an intuitive feel for where these equations come from. Um, the conservation of mass, conservation of momentum. In this case, we also have conservation of energy, which comes from the first law of thermodynamics. And there are some assumptions embedded in these equations. You know, we are assuming that um, the flow properties, density, uh, coefficient of viscosity, specific heat, and thermal conductivity are constants. These you can think of as now constants appearing in the governing equations. We'll assume that the flow is steady. So if I'm looking at a particular point in the flow, the, you know, the velocity, pressure, temperature won't change with time, and there are no body forces. And the unknowns are pressure, velocity, and temperature. Now, velocity is a vector, so we need to think about what components of velocity we want. If we do it as a 3D problem, we'll have three components of velocity. We won't do that. We will convert it to a 2D problem by making it by making the axisymmetric assumption. So we switch to the cylindrical coordinate system. Um, so to give you an idea of what that uh, coordinate system looks like, this is a cross-section through the pipe. So that's the pipe wall. That's the pipe axis. That Z is the axial coordinate. R is the radial coordinate. Now, if I look along z, in actually negative z, I'll see a circle. And let's say I have x and y coordinates like that. Now, instead of solving the problem in x, y, z coordinates, we will use the cylindrical coordinates r, theta, z. So r is here, z is here. Now, in this view, if I have a point like that, and I will say, pardon me, so that distance is r, and that's theta. And we'll say, you know, none of the variables will depend on theta. Um, that's a circumferential coordinate. So for instance, pressure will depend only on r and z. And um, velocity, you know, now we have to decompose it into the components and along the, the coordinates. We have the radial component, the axial quant component, and, and theta component, which is a swirl component, and we'll assume this is zero. So if I look at a point like that, I have the, I could have um, a axial velocity there, and then I could have a radial velocity there. And, and each of those velocity components will depend only on r and z, so the radial and an axial. Now compare that to the 2D Cartesian case where you would say u is a function of x, y, and with no dependence on z, and similarly the v component of velocity. This might be familiar to you. So if this looks confusing, you know, think of it as analogous to that, except that it's a little bit more complicated. Now with the axisymmetric assumption, we can figure out what the domain is. It turns out to be a rectangle, um, the domain over which we need to solve the, the governing equations. And, and so that's the axial coordinate, that's a radial coordinate, that's the axis of symmetry, that's where the flow comes in, that's where the flow goes out, and that's the wall. 
And if I take that uh, rectangle and revolve it 360 degrees about the axis, I will get the full pipe geometry. But this is, you know, I, I'll solve the equations over that rectangle. Now the height of the rectangle is equal to the radius of the pipe, and the length of the rectangle is equal to the unheated plus the heated lengths, L1 plus L2. So our radial coordinate goes from 0 to R, our axial coordinate goes from 0 to L. Now, if you had the circumferential coordinate, it would go from 0 to 2 pi, but we don't, you know, we don't have any dependence on that, so we can ignore that. And now, uh, with the axiometric assumption, we can recast the, you know, we can write down the equations. We can expand the equations in the cylindrical coordinate system. Uh, before that, uh, I should mention that Fluent calls the axial coordinate x and the radial coordinate y. Um, and, and so when you're in fluent, you know, you have to, when you see the horizontal axis, think axial, and when you see the vertical axis, think radial, and don't be confused by the x and y. Okay, so if we expand out the, uh, the governing equations in the cylindrical coordinates, um, that's what conservation of mass looks like, okay? And compare that to the, the 2D Cartesian case, which might be more familiar, du dx plus dv dy is equal to zero. So this, this equation is essentially that, but written in a different coordinate system. Similarly, conservation of momentum, so you have the f equal to ma in the radial direction and in the axial direction, and you have conservation of energy. <laughs> and so you can see it's a formidable set of partial differential equations. And um, before I get on to the boundary conditions, um, let's think about what are the unknowns. So we have pressure, uh, radial component of velocity, axial component of velocity, and temperature. And, and if you look at these three equations, you know, temperature doesn't appear in those equations and density is a constant. So we can solve these three equations and determine the pressure and velocity and then we can solve the energy equation for the temperature, which means that the energy equation gets decoupled from, from mass and momentum for the case where the density is, is constant. So we have a formidable set of partial differential equations. We have four partial differential equations. Um, we need to solve three first and then one. Um, and now that we have an idea of what the governing equations are, let's take a look at the boundary conditions next.